Chapter 28 Into the Fire By the time Malin finished instructing Link on how to tack up Epona, the sun was dipping beyond the horizon. Fortunately, the process of readying a horse for travel wasn't entirely new to Link, since he'd been introduced to the process when he'd last stayed on the ranch. By the time he was finished, the breeze that brushed across the hills surrounding the ranch carried the smell of smoke upon it. The wind whispered of war, and the smell unnerved Epona. She stomped her hooves, ears flat as she whinnied nervously. It's all right, girl, Link said, gently stroking her muzzle. Epona returned the gesture with an angry nip, and he jerked back. Epona, be nice, Malin scolded her. Did she bite you? Link shook his head. No, besides, I've had worse. He shared a dry smile with Navi. It took several attempts and minutes of quiet humming by Malin to calm Epona down. And even then, the frazzled mare stomped impatiently while Link busily secured his saddlebag. Once he was confident that Epona was ready, Link turned his attention to Blaze and knelt down beside the stallion to offer him a farewell. Not that the horse seemed that interested. I hope he will be all right. Link gently stroked the animal's nose its breath warm against his skin. Blaze would have to be fit to travel before the ranch closed. Otherwise, it would be too difficult to move him to Kakariko. A thick sheet of sweat covered him, as though he was the one who had just ran a race and not Epona. Malin crouched down beside Blaze and stroked his mane. This prompted Epona to announce her disapproval by nudging Malin in the back. Do you think he'll be okay? Link asked. The swelling has gone down since this morning, Malin said, still scratching the horse's nose. Blaze, unlike Epona, responded to this with total indifference. That's a good sign, Navi said. Horses are tough creatures, and he has been well cared for, Malin continued. I'm sure he will make it through. Blaze regarded her with wary eyes. He had none of Epona's frisky temperament. He couldn't be in better hands, Link said. Malin blushed and mumbled, thanks. Link watched her as she checked over Epona once more. Then, to his annoyance, Navi coughed with what he thought was impatience. Um, have either of you noticed Ingo's vanished? She asked. Now that she mentioned it, Link had noticed. Initially, he'd been glad, but the lack of any disturbance or sound was odd. I wouldn't worry about him, Malin said, looking up as Link peered outside yet again. He'll be around here somewhere, simmering quietly, I imagine. I hope you're right, Link said. Do you want me to check on him? Navi asked. That's a good idea, Link said. Just be careful. Make sure he doesn't see you watching him. Navi flew off without hesitation. Are you ever going to tell me what you've been up to since I last saw you? Malin asked. I will, but not right now. Link tried to deflect the question. Besides, it's too hard to explain. You could try me, Malin said. I can't, Link said solemnly, not meeting her eyes. I promise, I'll tell you everything later. I'll hold you to that. Link hadn't told her he was the hero of time. It would have sounded haughty, and he wasn't sure she would believe him. According to Impa, claiming to be the hero reborn had been common during the early years of Ganondorf's reign. The Gerudo let the false heroes run loose for a time, and then executed them. No doubt, in doing this, Ganondorf hoped the people would lose faith in their beloved goddesses. To Malin, Link was just another member of the Hyrulean Resistance. The Master Sword and Triforce Tattoo were nothing more than symbols of his defiance. Deciding he should not delay any longer, Link mounted Epona. The mare disregarded him. Instead, her attention fixed solely on Malin. No final goodbyes, fairy boy? Malin asked, pouting her lips in mock offense. Don't look at me like that, Link said, feeling flustered. I hate goodbyes. I've said it to too many people lately. He hadn't meant it to come out like that. 
Malin must have caught the implication in his voice because she was suddenly horror-struck. Link sighed. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. Eh, it's all right, she said quietly. Just look after yourself. Then her face brightened as she added, Ingo has family in Kakariko. They own the inn at Kakariko and have offered to keep us. You'll come and stay, won't you? I will, Link said. She leaned closer and kissed him affectionately on the cheek. Link felt a moment of dizziness as the heat rose in his cheeks. Even Malin looked a little abashed at what she'd done. Thank you for taking Epona for me, she said. You're welcome, he mumbled, still shaking off his surprise. Malin smiled, stroking Epona's silver mane. Be careful, and take care of him, girl. Epona's ears twitched, and she nuzzled Malin affectionately. She was still staring expectantly at her honor, as though waiting for Malin to jump into the saddle. Go on, girl. You be good now, Malin said. Link tried putting his heels to Epona's side again. She didn't budge, nor did she appear to have any intention of moving. Instead, her ears pricked up as she heard something outside the stables. Then Link heard it too. Voices. They were coming from the yard. It was Ingo. And he wasn't alone. Link could hear two women. And when he recognized their accent, his heart sank. Gerudo. Oh no. With a horrible sinking feeling in his gut, Link jerked his attention towards the door. So did Malin, worry creasing her face as she listened. So Ingo got the Gerudo after all. Link thought. Before the reality of the danger could sink in, Navi zoomed in through the window. There are Gerudo outside! She exclaimed. Without wasting a second, Link twisted around in the saddle. Malin, hide! You're not planning to attack them, are you? She asked, her eyes going the size of saucers. You only have a bow. Have you ever even tried mounted archery before? Against a dragon. That had not gone well and Link doubted Malin would believe it. Before he could say anything, she grabbed Epona's harness. Please, let me help you. Link shook his head, not wanting to put her in any more danger than she was in already. No, get out of here. The hurt in her eyes made him feel ashamed, but he would not let the Gerudo harm her. Go! But... Malin, listen to him and go, Navi prompted her gently. Malin nodded and scurried off out another door of the stable. If Link was going to escape with Epona... The only way out was the main door, straight towards the Gerudo. Are there only two? He asked Navi. Yes, Navi answered. Ingo must have roused them from the village. There's bound to be more. Link thought about dismounting and running, but there would be little chance of outrunning the Gerudo, and most of his equipment was in the saddlebag. Epona could easily outrun the Gerudo if they were on foot, and it was dark enough that they would soon lose him in the night. But now... The voices were getting closer. Ingo was telling the two Gerudo that Link had attacked him and his daughter. His daughter? Link thought with disgust. That liar threatened to kill her. I have an idea, he said, eyeing Navi as she looked between him and the door. What? Navi asked. I'm going to charge Epona into the Gerudo. A few seconds of surprise may be all we need to get out of here, Link said, gripping Epona's reins tightly. Navi's eyes bulged. Epona pawed the ground impatiently, as though she agreed with his plan. Are you crazy? Do you have any idea how badly this could end? Navi breathed. Link gave a wry smile, and Navi huffed with resignation. I'm not talking you out of this, am I? Any other ideas? I don't want to fight them if I can help it. You might not have a choice. It's you or them. And might I remind you... There's a lot at stake if you get captured. When Link glared at her, resolute and determined, Navi sighed. All right, fine. Just so you know, if you ever get us killed, I am never speaking to you again. With that, she zoomed into the pocket of Link's shirt. He quickly barked a command to Epona, prompting her to break into a gallop. The two Gerudo walking alongside Ingo did not look amused at having to deal with the unpleasant farmhand. Their sour faces turned to shock when they spotted the boy bolting out of the stable upon his crimson mare. Look out! One of them shrieked. 
Epona hurtled straight towards the Gerudo. They jumped out of the way, recovering within moments and raising their veils across their face. Up ahead, the wooden gates were shut. Link groaned. Ingo must have expected he would try to escape. There was nothing for it now, except hope Epona didn't crash right into the barricade. She could jump that easily, couldn't she? Navi was right. This is a crazy idea. The livid ranch owner brandished his pitchfork wildly, hollering all the while. One of the Gerudo raised an arm to the sleeve of her shirt, spinning around as she did so. Amidst the blur of motion, a blade shot out from the woman's outstretched hand. It sliced towards Link, missing him by a hair's breadth. Don't hurt the horse! Just stop the damned thief! Ingo roared. You will never leave this ranch, boy! Link was almost at the gate, and Epona showed no sign of faltering. He spurred her on, and Epona answered without hesitation. Now, just a few paces from freedom, Epona jumped, and Link clung to her as his stomach dropped. Epona's front hooves cleared the gate, just as another knife struck it. Then she landed nimbly upon the hard-packed earth beyond the ranch. Link slipped sideways, and the world spun in a horrid moment of vertigo. He grasped the saddle, hauling himself upright just in time. Epona whinnied triumphantly, as though mocking the Gerudo's inability to stop her. Link would have whooped had he not been so utterly terrified. He glanced back at the ranch to see the gate open. Ingo was shaking a fist furiously, while the two Gerudo stood behind him. They didn't give chase. Epona slackened her pace once Link was sure they were hidden as the last light of day faded. They were relatively safe, so long as no other creatures attacked them. He just hoped Malin would be all right. I can't believe it, Navi exclaimed from inside his shirt pocket. You actually pulled that off! Nor can I, Navi, Link replied, still gasping for breath. Nor can I. Link was not prepared for the sight or the state of the many people hurrying towards the village. Epona managed a steady canter for a time, and before long they were over halfway to Kakariko. He soon found himself lingering on the edges of an entire caravan of people. The signs of Ganondorf's treachery were everywhere. Farmhouses, that had once stood tucked against the roadside, were reduced to ruins. In some places, the livestock roamed free, emaciated beasts with little flesh to their scrawny hides. The steady trickle of people, all heading east, grew into a throng that wandered among the ransacked farms. Parents carried their smaller children in their arms, or in wagons. Others carried torches or lanterns that illuminated ragged cloaks and garments that were covered in grime, not to mention smelling of dirt and sweat. Other folk wore rusty and dented armor. The weapons they bore were in no better condition than their clothes. Most of these travelers stopped at the outskirts of Kakariko, where flickering campfires dotted the hillsides. Of the people Link could see, there was desperation in their eyes, a sense of hopelessness. He spotted one man with a horrible gash down his leg. The bandage was filthy, and Link could smell the sweet and sickly stench of rot as he rode by. It was an effort not to vomit. Hyrule is dying. Sheik's words seemed to take on a whole new meaning for Link as he made his way to the gates. Unlike last time he was here, there were watchers stationed at the entrance. Link nearly tensed at the sight of the Hylian and Gerudo guards, doing his best to appear inconspicuous. Even then, he had to stop himself from scratching his left hand. Link caught snippets of conversation about a battle in the southern provinces. He was sure it was the one Malin mentioned at Farron's Glade. And he knew that one of Hyrule's six fortresses were located there. Other people spoke of seeing a dragon flying to the south, wondering in fearful tones if it was going to the Gerudo's aid. Some said it had gone to the forest, and that the Gerudo king himself had been riding upon its back. Squeezing Epona through the crush of people without injuring anyone was no easy feat and Link was beginning to wonder whether he should find another way to get to the Goron's home. A tall and burly Hylian man stopped him at the gate, striding over to Link and thrusting a lantern in his face. Link flinched, feeling the intense heat of the lantern against his face. The man looked him up and down, not in the least bit apologetic. It's a hundred rupees to enter, he said gruffly. 
Without question, Link handed over five red rupees from his purse. A Gerudo was standing near the guard. She eyed Link with interest, but there was no hint of recognition in her eyes. Then, to his relief, the guard ushered him on. Link rode past the gates and away from the folk gathered behind him. Can I come out now? Navi asked. Her voice muffled as she shifted in his pocket. What's going on? Not yet, Link whispered back. Wait until we're on the mountain road, and I'll let you out. Kakariko had grown in seven years. All the paddocks in the town, except two, were now occupied by newly built houses, and a second inn, Elden Spring, remained untouched. Link stopped here briefly to let Epona drink. Once she'd had her fill, he rode on. He let Navi out once they were out of the village. She would need to help guide Epona along the trail so they did not tumble off the edge of a cliff. He did not dare ride Epona fast now. She was skittish on the narrow trails, and it took some reassuring to calm her down. These treacherous hills were meant for a mountain pony, not a horse of Epona's size. They passed the broken and half-buried ruins of Fort Eldon, just outside of Kakariko. She could not mention what had been the cause of the fort's demise but Link was sure it had something to do with the Sheikah Schism. He still didn't know much about that conflict, despite his efforts to glean some information out of Sheik and Impa. What was going on back there? Navi asked, once Epona was settled. The angry red clouds encircling Death Mountain billowed across the sky while an ominous rumbling of thunder pealed through the air. All in all, it left Link with a deepening sense of dread as he ascended those rocky slopes. A strange stench permeated the air, like the odor of a stagnant pond. It was as though he could sense Ganondorf's corrupting influence, like a poison spreading through the land. Link explained what he had seen on the road to Kakariko village, while Navi hovered near Epona and listened. It's just like Hyrule's civil war! She murmured when Link finished. What happened in that war? All I know is it lasted a hundred years, said Link. Navi was musing silently to herself. I don't know exactly how it started. They say Ashika, who was once an advisor to the king, poisoned his monarch's mind. His laws and punishments were extreme. So the Sheikah rebelled, and with the help of King Daphne's, they overthrew them. It was a terrible time. Many were forced to flee. Just as it is now. Do you think those people are trying to flee north? Most likely, Navi answered. They're probably trying to flee to Mithira, or over the northern mountains. What is in the northern provinces anyway? Link asked. He knew almost nothing of the countries beyond Hyrule's borders, or even the northern provinces. The Snowhead Mountains. Most of the country along the fringes are farmland, watered by the melting snow. They are owned by the various lords and ladies of Hyrule, said Navi. Or they were. She didn't elaborate. Link could already guess what had happened to them. And what's beyond those mountains, he asked, glad for something to distract him from their arduous journey. The northern kingdoms of Tabantha and Akala, Navi replied. I don't know much about the... The Snowhead Mountains are treacherous to cross, so as far as I'm aware, merchants or envoys are rare. When they did come, they had to venture up the river that winds through the Gerudo Desert and the land beyond. Perhaps he was more tired than he realized. Most of what Navi said went in one ear and out the other. There was nothing to be done, and resting here was not an option. He tried to remember everything that she had told him about the state of Hyrule. She'd never mentioned who the other members of the Ten Kingdoms were, or exactly what Ganondorf was up to. Something else bothered him about the Gerudo King. What do you think happened to Ganondorf? he asked. I thought the Triforce was supposed to turn the entire world, not just Hyrule, into a reflection of someone's heart when they touch it. It is, Nabi said. In theory, something must have happened that he didn't expect, 
because it doesn't look like this war has gone entirely the way he wanted. Link stared silently at the road for a while, or what little he could see of it. He had no idea what armies or battles looked like. Not the kind he knew from stories, where knights fought valiantly against a horde of foes and won. He imagined the reality was far less glamorous, especially given his own experiences. Navi and Link lapsed into a long silence as they climbed along the side of the mountain, high above the Valley of Hyrule. Looking down off the side of the ledge, Link could see the flickering pinpricks of light from the campfires in the valley below. Epona became more skittish the further up the path they traveled, her guy becoming labored. Deciding to let Epona have her way, he dismounted and led her slowly by the reins. He was not entirely sorry to leave the saddle. Painful abrasions marked his skin where the saddle had rubbed against his leggings. The road was well traversed. Wagon ruts cut through the dusty trail, and hoofprints pocketed the ground. Once, they came upon three burnt wagons. There was no sign of the horses or their riders, and the burnt wreckage of their caravan lay strewn across the road. This looks like Volvaki is doing, Navi observed grimly. They were probably trying to get to the other side of Death Mountain, Link said quietly, feeling sick as he imagined the fate that befell the caravan. I doubt that many people made it across, not with Fulvagia guarding the pass. Navi found a single pendant amongst the wreckage, bearing the Hyrulean crest upon it. Why did Volvagia kill them? The slaughter seemed senseless. If the people traveling the road knew the mountain pass was guarded by a dragon, they must have been desperate. Before he could get much further, the wind picked up, and soon it rose to a howling gale that threw ash and dust into the air. Link's eyes stung, and he shivered as the chill wind bit at every part of him that wasn't protected by his clothing. Navi took shelter in his bag as the blustery gale threatened to blow Epona off the road. He wasn't going to get any further without risking himself and Epona. Feeling foolishly annoyed that he'd been beaten by the weather, Link quickly sought for a shelter. He found one, a small cave, not far from the ruined wagons. There, in the cold confines of their little cave, he waited for the wind to blow itself out. It howled through the night, wailing like a wounded animal. It was freezing, and Link tried to find anything that resembled firewood or kindling. His search along the edges of the cave turned up nothing, so he resigned himself to setting up a blanket upon the stone. Doubting that anyone would come across him now, Link changed back into his tunic with his chainmail underneath. Then he strapped his sword and shield in place. Do we have much to eat? He wondered as his stomach grumbled. He rummaged through his saddlebag and came across the food Malin had given him. It was very simple. Some fruit, bread, and cheese. It wasn't enough to satiate his hunger, and he offered part of one loaf to Epona. She glared at him. It's all we've got, Link told her. As if in reply, Epona snatched the bread from his hand. Fussy horse, Link muttered. She probably wanted carrots. You should sleep until this wind dies down, Navi suggested as she watched him. I will wake you when it does. That was if he could sleep with the noise the wind was making. Before he went to sleep, he searched for a crevice in the cave floor. He found one that looked suitable and poured the contents of a water skin in it so Epona could drink. She snorted disdainfully, but drank anyway. Ignoring Epona, Link settled down on his cloak, sword beside him. It was hardly comfortable. The rocks dug into his side, and if he hadn't been so tired, he probably would not have slept at all. Instead, he fell into a fitful sleep filled with dragons and bloodied corpses. When Link woke up, the first fingers of light were touching the fields of Hyrule. Gone was the vista of shimmering green grass waving gently in the early morning breeze. Now, Link beheld hills of brown grass withered and parched beneath the cloudless sky. One other thing caught his eye, little white dots, no larger than rupees from where he stood, hundreds of them, scattered around the outskirts of Kakariko. They were tents. It never occurred to Link just how many people were in Hyrule, or how many were fleeing from the south. Ganondorf seemed more determined to crush their morale than kill them. 
It was a warning to any who sought to oppose him. Link noticed that the wide expanse of the Zora River resembled a tiny thread of water snaking through the land. The wide gray stones of the riverbed almost completely exposed. Nearly the entire river was dry, leaving Link wondering how the Zora were faring. Worry crept into his mind. He hoped they were okay. Epona traversed the road at a walk. After several hours, they were almost at the Goron City, arriving at the fork where the trail led up to the Dodongo's cavern. Link kept his eyes on the rolling mass of red clouds, sure that at any moment he would find a serpentine figure snaking through the air towards him. Impa's ring might protect him, but he did not know how Epona would react to the sight of a dragon. The last thing Link wanted was for her to take fright and send them both hurtling down the side of those jagged cliffs. He was so busy pondering this unpleasant thought that it took a sharp whisper from Navi to bring him back to reality. She directed his gaze to the trail. Two Gorons ampled towards him, approaching from the shelf he knew led to Dodongo's cavern. Ah, if it isn't the legendary Dodongo Buster, one of them greeted. Dodongo Buster? Navi snorted with amusement, prompting Link to shoot her a death glare that only made her grin. My name is Gemite, the first Goron boomed. I believe you met my companion before, Onyx. Link looked at Onyx. The burlier Goron was less welcoming than his companion. We've been expecting you, he said. Darunia told me you were coming to help fight Volvagia. He did? Link asked. Where is he? Staring at the ground rather than at him, the two Gorons growled solemnly. Link's heart sank, and a sickening wave of fear crashed through him. Onyx held out a scroll tube, clutched in one hand. This is from Darunia. He left it for you, and was quite adamant that you get it. Link frowned as he grabbed the scroll tube. What do you mean? Link asked slowly, and then more firmly. What's happened to him? The Gorons exchanged another uncomfortable glance. He has gone to fight Volvagia. Said the dragon was badly injured and could be slain now, Gemite told him. Unraveling the letter from the tube, Link looked down at the large squiggly mess scrawled upon the parchment. Sheik was right. Darunia's handwriting is atrocious, Navi muttered as she began to read. Link, when I was told you were coming, I wanted to have a Goron to man talk with you. When I was told of Ganondorf's threats, I knew this could wait no longer. I have gone to the Fire Temple. I mean to make sure Volvagia does not return to full strength, so that you can slay him when you arrive. I know Volvagia cannot be killed without the sword you wield, but at least I can make your task easier. It is likely Ganondorf will try to stop us. If I do not succeed, Ganondorf will use Volvagia to turn the Ten Kingdoms into a wasteland. I have another plan, to make sure Volvagia never escapes, should we fail to stop him. As a sworn brother, I ask you to help my people. Some of them may still be trapped in the temple as Ganondorf attacked us a few days ago and took them prisoner. I am counting on you. Darunia. P.S. Use the tunnels. How long ago did he leave? Navi asked when she finished. Not that long ago, said Gemite. You might still catch him if you hurry. Which way is the temple? Link asked. Gemite pointed down the switchback path to the trail that led further along Death Mountain. Go that way, and you will see the stairs leading up to the shelf where the temple resides. There is a landslide part way up, so your horse won't make it. At Link's worried look, Gemite added, We have food and water in a stable for her. Darunia had one built to accommodate the people fleeing along our mountain pass. Well, that was until Volvagia got out. Link handed Gemite Epona's reins. Please, take good care of her, he said. Gemite nodded. She is not the first horse I have seen. Don't worry, Dodongo Buster. She is in good hands. He paused at Link's anxious frown. What is in that message? 
Jemite asked curiously. No time to explain, Link told him, bidding the Goron farewell. He broke into a run, going as fast as his legs could carry him towards the fire temple. A battle raged within the Temple of Din, or what the Shaka would have referred to as the Fire Temple. The entire structure trembled as the Gorons tried in vain to vanquish the evil within it. The Zalfos, bipedal lizards that looked almost human except for the head and clawed limbs, charged through the labyrinth of corridors towards the entrance. Darunia led his clan in the temple's defense, much to the discontent of the Goron elders. His wife would not have approved either. Thankfully, he'd sent her on an errand deeper into the mountains. Ganondorf himself led the reptilian beasts, but did not join the fray. He seemed to be waiting. For what, though? Fulvagia. It didn't matter to Darunia. He intended to kill that sniveling coward. To Darunia's immense annoyance, his path to the Gerudo King was blocked by the man's minions. It was a minor dilemma as far as the Goron leader was concerned. He itched to get close enough to slam his hammer into that demon. A bellowing crescendo erupted from the Gorons assembled in the hall as they swung any weapon they held at the Lizalfos. Darunia led them, crashing his giant hammer into a lizard that was dumb enough to get too close to him. It never got up. Darunia smashed his hammer across the armor of a second Lizalfos, slamming it into a pillar with a bone-snapping crunch. His brothers charged forward, clubs, maces, and hammers swinging and slamming into the horde of snarling and hissing reptiles. Darunia's attention was brought back to the fray by one of Ganondorf's minions, sword slicing towards the Goron chieftain. Darunia's hammer met it easily. A clash of metal and the blade went flying. The Lizalfos barely had time to react before Darunia's hammer pulverized its skull. Another of the lizards thrust a spear at Darunia, shattering the shaft against Darunia's rocky hide. With a loud crack, Darunia's hammer slammed into its side. Another Lizalfos attempted to attack him from the side, only to succumb to a savage blow from the Goron's hammer. You cannot win, Darunia. It was foolish of you to challenge me like this. Ganondorf's voice boomed from across the room. I would have left your kind in peace. But you had to make this difficult. Darunia did not fall for this lie. So long as we served you, you mean. He growled, raising his voice to a roar. Come and face me, demon. You call yourself a king, but you refuse to challenge me alone. You are nothing but an honorless coward. Ganondorf chuckled as Darunia caught motion out of the corner of his eye. A moblin was charging at him with a spear. Is this all you can threaten me with? Darunia scoffed. Where is your dragon now, Gerudo King? The title was delivered with mockery, and Darunia rose his hammer to strike down the pig-faced monster in front of him. Crack! Another Goron took the monster down. Ordinarily, that might have annoyed Darunia, but he nodded his thanks instead. Grabbing the dead beast's spear, Darunia hurled it towards Ganondorf. The Gerudo laughed at the spectacle, raising his hands to send a stream of fire into the spear, reducing it to ashes. Damn that Gerudo and his magic tricks! Something seemed to get Ganondorf's attention. For the next moment, he grinned, opening a purple vortex which disappeared when he stepped through it. Coward! Come back here and fight me! The Lizalfos stopped fighting, turning their attention to a hallway beyond a large archway opposite the main entrance. A deep, booming roar echoed through the temple. Volvagia. The Lizalfos went into a frenzy. Some ran, some attacked each other, and the rest scrambled to get out of the hall. Mm. This could be problematic. Darunia said, his voice a deep rumble. Impa had said that Volvagia was almost killed. It should have taken longer to revive him. Darunia's plan had been to keep Volvagia from returning to full strength and seal him in the temple as a final resort. Now, there was no time to ponder how Volvagia had been revived so quickly. 
I have a bad feeling about this, brother, grumbled the Goron next to Darunia. Darunia scowled, clenching the hammer in his hands. <sighs> You've always got a bad feeling about something, Darunia replied in his gravelly tone. He pointed back at the fleeing Lizalfos. Are you a Goron or not? Fight them! The Gorons charged, and Volvagia burst out of the hallway with a roar. To Darunia's dismay, the dragon had indeed returned to full strength. Definitely problematic. He changed his mind about running. Sometimes, it just wasn't a good day to die. Run, brothers! He bellowed. Head for the tunnels and find the others. I will take care of Volvagia. Some of the Gorons hesitated, looking dismayed at the prospect of abandoning their leader. When he repeated the order, they reluctantly obeyed. Go! Darunia roared as Volvagia closed in. Darunia, one of the closest Gorons said. I won't leave you. Not with that thing. A column of fire erupted from Volvagia's mouth, incinerating one Goron whose dying screams cut Darunia to the core and fueled the flames of his wrath. Leave me and get out of here! Darunia roared. The last of the Gorons obeyed, fleeing for the hallways that ran off the side of the atrium. All of them knew not to go near the main entrance. Darunia turned back to Volvagia and hollered to get the dragon's attention. He sprinted as fast as was physically possible for a Goron. Volvagia was a menacing sight up close now that Ganondorf controlled him. Darunia could have easily ridden Volvagia. Once he might have considered it, but that was long ago, when Volvagia was his friend. Now there was no sign of the dragon Darunia had raised from an egg. It was only an empty shell, a thrall controlled by the Demon King. It stomped towards Darunia with a guttural roar. Darunia lunged forward, giving a bellowing cry as he brought his hammer down towards the dragon's snout. The beast's steel-like talons lashed forward, and Darunia stepped aside, slamming his hammer into Volvagia's face. He leapt for the horns protruding from Volvagia's skull and leveraged himself up onto the dragon's head, intending to slam his hammer down. Volvagia shook his head vigorously, but Darunia managed to hold on and slam his hammer into its skull. Dazed, the dragon stopped trying to shake him off and staggered. The effect only lasted an instant before the dragon bounded towards the nearest wall, and Darunia only had a second to register what it was doing. This is going to hurt. Crunch! The blow knocked the wind from Darunia's body. Stars filled his vision as his body slammed painfully into the wall. The hammer dropped from his grasp, striking the wall with a ring as though it had struck an anvil. Crash! A second time, Darunia's head struck the wall with a painful crack, and his vision darkened. His hand went to the medallion on his neck. He tried to draw on its magic, but just like the last time he'd tried, it didn't work. He slipped, clawing at Volvagia's scales as he tried to grip onto some sort of purchase. He managed to snatch hold of the ridge above the dragon's eye. With one desperate punch, he slammed his fist into Volvagia's eye. A roar of agony ensued from the dragon's throat, and it threw him off. Darunia landed on his back, looking up at the bloody mess that was once Volvagia's left eye. The dragon opened its mouth and advanced. It was going to kill him. Darunia stared defiantly at Volvagia, ready to embrace whatever fate the goddesses had in store for him. He thought of the other Gorons and his son. Then he heard someone shout his name. He looked up in time to see a green-clad Hylian at the temple's entrance, holding a blade that he'd only heard of in legends. The Master Sword. Link. Only Link did not realize the danger he was in. Four chests of bombs stood on either side of the door, intended to ensure Volvagia would be sealed forever in the temple should Darunia fail. He was not even supposed to come this way. Onyx was meant to warn him. Link, get away from those chests! Darunia roared. Before Darunia could do anything, Volvagia made his move, belching fire towards Link who jumped away. Acting quickly, Darunia tried to distract Volvagia by retrieving his hammer and slamming it into the dragon's injured eye. A jet of fire streamed from Volvagia's mouth. The dragon had been aiming at Link, but the hammer blow had dazed the beast. 
The fire billowed straight towards the chest and their explosive contents. Fulvagia's one good eye widened in horror as he realized his mistake. Link must have realized what was happening, or Navi must have warned him, because he heeded Darunia's words and was bolting away from the nearby chests. It wasn't enough. With a deafening boom so loud it was sure to deafen even the goddesses within their heavenly realm, the treasure chests exploded. The roar of the explosion deafened him, driving through his ears with the force of daggers. It was a sickening boom that reverberated through the mountain like a cataclysmic eruption, followed only by the roar of stone and masonry crashing to the ground. The shock wave hit Link with such force that he was winded. The master sword fell from his grasp and he was airborne. His ears were ringing amidst the din. He didn't even have time to scream before he hit the hard rocky trail beneath him. Somewhere, a fairy screamed his name. Thank you.